Bryce Young is set to get the start once again on Sunday versus Kansas City. What does he need to show Carolina over the final seven games of this season? I'll answer that question among other listener questions in this weekly Wednesday mailbag edition of Locked On Panthers. You are Locked On Panthers, your daily Carolina Panthers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, Julian Council, talking Carolina Panthers with you every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Your team every day. That's our motto here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Thanks for watching this episode here on YouTube and listening wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Be sure to follow me, Julian Council, on Twitter at Julian Council, where on Wednesdays, a like. Today, I answer your weekly Wednesday mailbag questions. Going to be doing that throughout the entirety of the regular season. All you got to do is either at me or DM me over here on Twitter at Julian Council. And I'll answer your weekly Wednesday mailbag questions right here on Locked on Panthers. This episode of Locked on Panthers is brought to you by Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code all lowercase locked on NFL to win $50 instantly when you play $5 weekly. Wednesday mailbag is back. The Carolina Panthers are back on the field on Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern time against the now 9-1 and Kansas City Chiefs as they lost on Sunday to Buffalo, Charlotte's second favorite team. Hopefully Charlotte's top favorite team, the Carolina Panthers, can make it two losses in a row for Kansas City. Let's get into the mailbag today. A little shorter mailbag than typically – Bye week last week. I think it was a bye week for a lot of fans as well as didn't get a lot of questions, which most of them come when a major event happens like a game. So not really all that stressed about it, but I do think I have a couple of good ones on the show today that we'll get into. Starting off with Aubrey, who says, Bryce seems to be finding a bit of swagger managing the offense while leaning on the run game. What do we need to see over the last seven games passing the ball to solidify him as a key piece to the offense next season and beyond? Dave Knauss, who spoke to the media on Monday about Bryce Young being the quarterback once again on Sunday against Kansas City, came out and said that, quote, this is about the continued progress. This is about Bryce looking more and more confident in Germany. I just felt a real confidence, just an aggressiveness to his play. And, of course, the end result, winning, he continues to do the things that put us in a position to put him back out there and continue to build on that. But when asked, would this be the move for the rest of the season? Or would they continue to take a week to week? He said, yes, yes, we will take a week to week. We'll continue to look at the film, look at the whole situation and weigh all of those things. And now let me go to a part of the first quote that he said about Bryce Young saying, quote, he continues to do things that put us in a position to put him back out there and continue to build on that. So what are some of the things that Bryce Young has been doing that have put them in a position to continue to put him back out there? Well, Dave said winning his aggressiveness, taking care of the football, the accuracy that we've seen over the last couple of weeks of the season and these two straight wins against New York and Munich and then at home against New Orleans. Those are the things, as long as the confidence and the team's confidence in him that have put the Panthers and Dave Knauss's words in the position to continue to put Bryce back out there and continue to build on all the good things he's been doing over the last three weeks, but especially the last two weeks in those wins against these Saints and against the Giants. Now, when you look at the overall picture, Bryce Young has not played that well in comparison to the rest of the NFL. It's just a fact. And you can try and find the good numbers, but they're really hard to find aside from the last two games where they won. And it's not like his numbers were overwhelming. I thought he played much better in the Saints game than the Giants game. And neither one of them looking on paper would make you think, oh, yeah, Bryce Young's really going out there and killing it. He was really good against the Saints. I didn't think he was that great against the Giants, but he made a key third down throw to Xavier Leggett that kept the clock running and I think preserved that going to overtime and posed to the Panthers losing and maybe Daniel Jones still being the starting quarterback up there in New York. But looking at some of the numbers, he's 34th in the NFL in completion percentage. He's 35th in passing success rate, 36th in adjusted yards per attempt, 35th in passer rating, 34th in QBR and as the fourth highest interception percentage. Now you hear the numbers 34th, 35th, 36th, and you wonder what is that out of? It's mainly out of 36 quarterbacks that qualify according to pro football reference. So Bryce Young has been 
a bottom three quarterback this season when looking at those numbers and passing yards. He doesn't have a ton of them. He has not thrown a ton of touchdowns. He has not thrown a ton of interceptions, but still he's not one of the lowest interception total guys in the NFL as the interception rate goes out there and tells you as he's fourth highest in the league. So in order for him to continue to start and put the Panthers in a position to put him back out there and build on the positive thing that he's doing, he's got to be more accurate than he's been in these five starts so far this season. He's got to show the ability to stretch the field. And going back to Monday, Dave Canales came out and said that it's on him. He has not given Bryce that many opportunities to stretch the field. And these go back to conversations that we have had on this show about me not believing that Dave Canales believes in Bryce Young. And, well, look at the play calling. Look at all of the short plays and the designs on third down and longs where there's just not a concept that's going to lead to a first down in that situation. And we saw the screens on back-to-back-to-back -back -to -back plays against New Orleans in the game where Carolina eventually won, but had momentum. And the offense was playing really well. Bryce was playing well. Why not give him those opportunities? Now, having seen the confidence that Bryce has in himself and the team has in Bryce, maybe Dave Canales starting on Sunday in a game where I think they're going to have to try to stretch the field against Kansas City in that great defense. Maybe he finally gives Bryce the opportunity to show his ability to stretch the field, which we have seen a couple times at – Jalen Coker throw against Denver. We saw even just throwing it down the field on that PI that they got that set up that touchdown run by Chuba Hubbard in the wing into New Orleans. Those are opportunities that Bryce has not been given a ton of, but when he has gotten them, he's overthrown a couple of guys. Think back to a third down uh, against the Giants in Munich where he just overthrew Jalen Coker. We saw an overthrow against Denver the first time they even tried to throw the ball down the field. He overthrew Xavier Lee get if you can start hitting on those more consistently but also just be given the opportunity that can lead him to get the opportunity to be the guy next year to solidify his spot as a key player on the offense and beyond and looking at it as well taking care of the football he did that last week he really did that the week prior against the Saints where it was Lee get who just got stripped that should have been a fumble instead of an interception. I do see why it was an interception. I would love for them to rule that as a fumble instead of saying that the quarterback's at fault as that goes against his sack total or his interception total, rather. And I know fantasy football, I don't know if anyone had Bryce as their quarterback there, but fantasy football-wise, that would be just so frustrating to see your quarterback get an interception on a play where that was clearly the wide receiver's fault on that interception. There's plenty of other examples to where you would rather the receiver be blamed when the receiver cuts the route short or the receiver has the ball just go out of his hand and he goes in the defensive back's hands. But, you know, that's another conversation for another day as far as fantasy-wise goes. But he's got to be more accurate. He's got to show the ability to stretch the field and be given those opportunities and take care of the football. He does all three of those things, and I think this passing offense is going to be much better than what we've seen over the course of the first 10 games, whether it's been Bryce or Andy Dalton, aside from really that Raiders game and that Saints game, or not the Saints game, but the uh, the Bengals game, those two weeks, week three and week four, when Andy first took over for Bryce as starting quarterback, he does those three things. Be more accurate, show the ability to strip the field and take care of the football. And I do think that he'll put himself in a position to potentially be the quarterback again in 2025 and possibly beyond. Dan Morgan, he's the Panthers GM. He has had a couple of solid moves, I think, so far. And someone is asking, where are some of the best moves he made as far as trade, free agency, the draft? We'll go over those here in just a moment on Locked on Panthers. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. Prize picks is the best way to get action on sports in over 30 states, including California, Florida, Georgia, Texas, and of course here in North Carolina. Sorry, South Carolina. Not just yet, but drive up to the border of North Carolina and play over at Prize Picks. Sign up today and get fifty dollars instantly when you play five dollars. You don't even need to win to receive the fifty dollar bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize Picks is the best way to win real money this football season. Which players are going off? Which ones aren't? Make your picks in less than sixty seconds and turn your sports opinions into real money all season long on Prize Picks. Download the app today and use code Locked On NFL to get fifty dollars instantly after you play your first five dollar lineup. That's code Locked On NFL to get fifty dollars instantly after you. Play your first five dollar lineup. Price picks run your game. 
Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists that tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration. That's the blame for your rough next day. Pre-alcohol produces an enzyme to break down this byproduct. Just remember to make z your first drink of the night. Drink responsibly and you'll feel your best tomorrow. So again, here's how to use z -biotics. Step one, drink pre-alcohol. Step two, drink responsibly. Step three, Enjoy tomorrow. Go to zbiotics.com slash locked on NFL to learn more and get 15% off your first order when you use locked on NFL at checkout. Zbiotics is back with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund you your money. No questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL at checkout for 15% off. Back here on Locked On Panthers Weekly Wednesday Mailbag edition of the show, either at me or DM me over on Twitter. And I have signed up for Blue Sky. It's the same handle at Julian Council. And then I know they have like dot B ski dot social, but at Julian Council, just search my name if you're over on Blue Sky. I'm going to primarily be over on Twitter. I did post one thing on Blue Sky. I don't know what we're calling it. I guess it's not. A tweet, obviously. I guess you don't call anything. I mean, it's X now, but I've been calling it Twitter. You put in Twitter.com. That's what comes up. And I think X is just a dumb name. Sorry, Elon Musk. No offense. Um, So I'm on Blue Sky. You can start hit me up there as well if you'd like, but either Twitter mainly or maybe Blue Sky if you're over there. I'm going to be primarily over on X, Twitter, whatever, posting, which I rarely do at this point in time. It's turned into just a cesspool, and the only thing I posted on Blue Sky is that I cannot wait for that place to devolve into a chaotic cesspool just like Twitter. But the vibes are good. It's very calm over there. Very pleasant. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. As we know, the world is a crazy place, especially online. Jake. Well, let's talk about Dan Morgan and how he's done so far as Panthers GM. The hallway elevation back in January led Dan Morgan to the GM role and president of football operations title as well. And I think so far he's done a pretty solid job. So Jake says, what has been Dan Morgan's best move regarding the roster at this point in the season? Trades, recent signings, draft, and his worst. So let's talk about the positive first, of course. Um, looking at trade free agency, and draft. I'm going to pick one from each of those. Starting out with trade. I think the trade that he made back during the draft with the Rams is my favorite trade that he's made so far. Of course, the Jonathan Mingo trade, the Cowboys, and Jerry Jones being just so thirsty and really dumb. Trading for Mingo, where from a scout's perspective, this is a guy who was drafted in the second round. He does not have a lot of money left on his deal. He has two more years left, and the Cowboys really liked him. Coming out. Okay, totally understand that. Here's the problem. Jonathan Mingo can't play. So for the Panthers to get a uh, fourth-round pick, what was it? Second, yeah, fourth-round pick for Jonathan Mingo. That's good business. Good for Carolina. They should have never drafted him. Uh, not surprised at all that it did not work out. But for them to be able to get a second-round pick from the Rams, I like that even more. As we know, in 2025, the Panthers will not have their second round pick. That will be the final compensation that will go to the Chicago Bears for the trade that got the Panthers a number one overall pick and sent DJ Moore and a couple other things like the number one overall pick that turned to Caleb Williams over to the Bears. The Panthers really wanted a second round pick. And Dan Morgan likes to have a pick in every single round of the draft. It's pretty sound philosophy. Of course, you'd want to bite at the apple during every single round. And they did not have that bite heading into the 2024 NFL draft. But they came out of not even the end of night two with a second-round pick when they traded 39th overall pick, which they had already owned. Not that they didn't own it, but they got from the Giants with the Brian Burns trade. So the fact that they had two second-round picks allowed them to feel comfortable moving up from 33 to 32 to get Xavier Lee get, and already knew they had 39 from the Burns trade. So they had 39. They took, they moved it, to, they gave it to the Rams in exchange for 52nd overall, a fifth round pick, and of course, the crown jewel, the second in 2025. Now, that second round pick turned out to be AD Mitchell for the Colts, and the Panthers ended up trading that second round pick to move up to get Jonathan Brooks at 46, and that ended up being AD Mitchell for the Colts at 52nd overall. Uh, the fifth round pick, number 155, actually ended up being Jeremiah Trotter Jr., going to the Eagles as that was eventually sent over to Philadelphia, uh, either by the Rams or 
by Indianapolis. I don't remember who did it. Uh, but the second round pick, we don't know who it's going to be yet. But we know that the Rams wanted to get Braden Fisk out of Florida State, who's been tremendous this season as a rookie. Him and Jared versus both those defenders from FSU. See how the Knolls have fallen apart without them. But I just think that's a great move to be able to get a second round pick and be able to leverage having two second round picks in 2024 draft, knowing you can move up in the first round, so have another one, be able to move back and get one from a team that really wanted to get a player when there was a run on interior defensive linemen going on in the early part of the second round. So Bravo, that's the best trade. Now the Deontay Johnson trade, and slash the Dante Jackson trade looked like the best one until you found out at the very end, the only guy who's still around is Mike Jackson. who has been a solid uh, cornerback too. He's one of, I would be about him half, CB2 in the NFL, but still, he's been a solid player for Carolina. He's helped them win a couple of games this year, so that's a solid trade. But really, getting that second-round pick next year, I think that's the best trade that Dan Morgan has made. As far as free agent signings, got to be Robert Hunt, right? Signed into a five-year, $100 million contract, $63 million guaranteed. That's the price of the brick when you're coming off of the worst season in your franchise's history. I guess 115, maybe it became in the first team of the NFL to go 2-15. and 15. Hey, history's made. You'll take history, even if it's not great history, I suppose. So far, he's been solid. He's played in every single game this season. The only starting offensive lineman to play in all 10 games. Knock on wood. He's 16th out of 77 offensive guards as far as PFF goes. That is the highest grade for a Panthers offensive lineman, by the way, as well. Right above Damian Lewis, who's sitting there at 17th. And maybe there's an argument that he's their best offensive lineman as he costs less. And he's been playing, at least according to PFF, by kind of the same level as Robert Hunt. But I think Robert Hunt has been better. He's 10th out of 77 offensive guards in a run blocking grade. And that's one thing the Panthers wanted to do is be a road grading team up front. And he's been able to do that. Now, PFF. They don't love him so much as far as pass protecting. They say he's giving up three sacks and 15 pressures. Maybe this is not an offensive line that's giving up a ton of anyways, and I think he's played really well. So maybe they got it right. They, they credit things differently from what you might see on Pro Football Reference or maybe some football outsider stuff. I, I don't really know. But all I know is he's played really well. He's been worth the money that they gave him, and he's going to continue to be that guy moving forward. Draft-wise, I don't think you can say we get because he's a first round pick and he's out there starting and like that was the expectation. And, you know, I think he's been fine. I don't think it's JT Sanders. I really think it's Trevor Wallace who coming into things. I don't think a lot of people expected a lot out of him as a rookie, but looking at the situation with the get being banged up during OTAs and early on in training camp, not knowing when Jonathan Brooks come back, which he's now coming back this weekend. JT Sanders is getting thrown in there as well. Chas Smith way was not the way his turn. Jaden Crumbity as well. And then Michael Baird, of course, didn't make the roster or was traded away because he wasn't going to make the roster. Trevor Wallace really impressed among the rookies during training camp. And I was asked, I think by, Someone down in Louisiana, because every time we play the Saints or the Panthers play the Saints, rather, I'm not out there. I get asked by like the entire state of Louisiana to go on the radio, and someone is asking which rookie thinks be an impact player. I go, probably Trevor Wallace, but I don't really know how he's going to on the field. But he's gotten on the field, unfortunately, because Shaq Thompson tore his Achilles, and he's likely done as a Carolina Panther. And now we're seeing the future, at least next season, at linebacker with Trevin and Josie Jewell, and certainly the future of the position with Trevin Wallace there in the middle, uh, wearing that green dot for Carolina and. He's second on team with 50 tackles. He's played the sixth most defensive snap so far. PFF doesn't love him. They have him 68 out of 82 linebackers, and then they have him 80th out of 83 as far as run defense grade. I think the guy's been solid, man, considering what he's been thrown into, where he had to play a couple, like his first career start, he was playing next to Clodden Sherrillis. And that was also Clodden Sherrillis' first career start. I'm not trying to sit here and say that Clodden's not a good player, but like understand he would be in a better situation had Josie Jewell been healthy the entire time, obviously. And once Josie Jewell came back, we've seen Josie play really good football. We've also seen Trevin play good football as well. I think just looking at the value getting him in the third round and how the Panthers have really struggled over the course of like their entire existence, 30 seasons, to find good players past the first round, that is, I believe, the best traffic he's made thus far. The worst thing he's done... Hmm, that's interesting. I guess you would probably say the Deontay Johnson trade to Baltimore, which let's go to 
tankathon.com right now to go see where things would stand as far as that draft pick where there's eight compensatory picks at the end of the fifth round. Right now, Carolina is sitting eighth overall in the draft where Baltimore is sitting at, where are they at? Where's Baltimore at? They're 24th. So let's do this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then 15 and then 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So they moved up 24 spots right now from the sixth round to the fifth round with that pick swap. I suppose that's the worst thing because you would have liked to have gotten more. Now, Mike K brought up a really good point. Mike K, the Charlotte Observer, was on the show on Monday, brought up a really good point about, well, the Steelers basically got a six rounder for him. So what was his market going to really improve to? considering he only had like three good games in Carolina, only played seven games, period. And people know he's malcontent. And it's not like he's made an impact yet in Baltimore. Um, so that could be the worst thing. I don't really hate anything he's really done so far. I got, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, is there any other trades I didn't like? Um, I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't think Dan Morgan's done too bad of a job so far. So kudos to him, and we'll see. Like I tracked all the trades that Scott Fitterer made. I'm tracking all the trades that Dan Morgan made, makes and all the moves as well. And we'll probably sit down in the offseason and evaluate Dan Morgan's first year as Carolina Panthers GM. So right now, I think he's done a solid job, and we'll see if it results to wins in the future. I just look at the draft class and what he has, what we get, with Wallace, with Sanders so far, and what they provided, what Brooks is likely going to provide. If you get four, four out of seven and hit on those guys, that's a, high, that's a good hit rate. And you want to have that hit rate moving forward if you're Carolina under Dan Morgan. So good job by Dan so far. All right, take a quick pause, come back, answer a couple more of your weekly Wednesday mailbag questions right here on Locked on Panthers. Time is our most precious commodity, so don't waste it scrolling through the same mind-numbing content for hours and hours. How can you spend it wisely to improve yourself? Our sponsor, Hillsdale College, is offering more than 40 free, that's right, free online courses and Here's just a few of the courses that are available right now. Constitution 101, the meaning and history of the Constitution, Introduction to Free Market Economics, The Great American Story, A Land of Hope, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Republic. All of Hillsdale's courses are self-paced, so you can start whenever and tune in wherever. Plus, you can go deeper with readings, quizzes, discussions, or just enjoy the lectures. Go right now to hillsdale.edu slash lockdown to enroll. There's no cost and it's easy to get started. That's hillsdale.edu slash lockdown to register. Hillsdale.edu slash lockdown. A few more questions here on this weekly Wednesday mailbag edition of Locked On Panthers. Again, at me or DM me over on Twitter at Julian Council. Get your questions into me for next week's edition of the show. Typically, after the game on Sunday, send those questions in. Get them in by Tuesday, 4 or 5 o'clock p.m. And they'll be on the show potentially on Wednesday. If I don't have them on the show on Wednesday, someone probably asked the same question or I'll just answer it via your DMs as it may make more sense there than on the show. But appreciate everybody who participates by sending in questions. Ray. Appreciate you. And he's asking, based off of some conversations that we've had, and I think Mike K of the Charlotte Observers brought this up. I brought it up on the show. If the Panthers do have Bryce Young back next year, they're going to need to bring in, I think, a younger, more athletic veteran quarterback to push him. Ray's asking, who could you see as a possible younger, more athletic veteran quarterback to push Bryce Young? Andy Dalton's 37, so I don't think it's going to be Andy. I think Andy's happy to just be able to get any opportunity to play football. And he probably enjoys living in Charlotte as well. Any person who's ever lived in Cincinnati does because they all live down here. And it's, now he's not from Cincinnati. He's from Texas. I understand that. But you get my, un, you catch my drift here. If you live in the city and all the Ohioans who love Ohio, but don't live in Ohio, but live down here. Um, okay. So I got three, four names really that I'm looking at. First one. What about Sam Darnold? Hmm? What about him? Y'all know how I feel. And I was talking to my dad. Actually, I was over there on Sunday this man has a great bourbon collection. We were just trying out all the Wellers. We were having CYPV, Craft Your Perfect Bourbon. We're having an Antique 107, some 12 year. Had some stag as well. Every time I go over there, I call my dad's like kitchen allocated because he has just an insane amount of bourbon. He told me he's going to get a 20 year bottle of Pappy Van Winkle. So, going to need that man to tell me where that's at because it's going to magically disappear. Um, either way, he was over there. I was over there. He was talking to me like, hey, your boy. Who you didn't like over here in Carolina? He's playing pretty well. It's like, oh, Sam Darnold. Didn't he throw three picks against Jacksonville? And when you look at EPA numbers, is he still like not the greatest? Like Sam, I'm kidding. Like 
well, not kidding, but Sam has played good football. I think Kevin O'Connell's done a tremendous job with him. And the fact that defense has been excellent, that has taken some pressure off of Sam. Also having Aaron Jones in the backfield, having Justin Jefferson, like that helps. But yeah, Sam has played good ball. And like, I am legitimately happy for him. Now we got to stop with the whole Sam Darnold is going to be like a top 10 quarterback thing. I just don't think it's going to happen. He is what he is and he can be a starter. I think he's proven that so far this season that right, right circumstance. That's the case of the majority of dudes in the league. He can be a good player for you. you can help you win games. And so far he's helped the Vikings win eight games. They're going to be a playoff team and they'll get to the wild card round and he'll likely blow it. But still, Things weren't necessarily great for him in Carolina. Like the offensive line, as we know, was not talented. Then they had 13 out of 17 different starting offensive line combinations that season. Chris McCaffrey, who he really leaned on early on that season, he was not healthy. They didn't have much of a run game to lean on after McCaffrey was out as they tried to, but as a rookie, uh, there were just problems that they had in Carolina. And I can't say that all those issues were all on Sam Darnold. Now, he did not play well. And we understand that, like, Bryce Young didn't play well last year. Were those all on Bryce? No, but still, he didn't help. Baker Mayfield did not play well. Was it all on Baker? No, but he did not help. You got to find a way to potentially overcome those situations, which did not work out. But I think going to San Francisco's helped him. Certainly being with Kevin O'Connell's helps. And I do wonder, you know, would it work out a second time around? Hell, like, look at it's not the apples apples comparison but vance joseph used to be the head coach in denver and now he's the dc different ownership group totally get that now same owner here in carolina different head coach different gm who was here as an assistant general manager when sam darnold was here got here the same off season that probably would yield him to not do it again i don't know if sam would want to come back to carolina that that would be a name because he's i don't think he's gonna be like guy long term in minnesota they, they took jj mccarthy they're gonna eventually put him in there probably next season justin fields remember back in 2021 everyone was saying oh even though that they had signed sam darnold go get justin fields and i was telling you well guys if the Panthers wanted any of these quarterbacks, they probably would have done the trade that, well, they did to get Bryce Young, but the one that San Francisco did to get Trey Lance, and they didn't do it. And they already have Sam Darnold telling you that that's who they want. He had two more years. It was basically a two-year, $22 million deal once he exercised fifth-year option. That was their mindset, not Justin Fields. And Justin, I think, played good football for Pittsburgh. He admitted that he didn't play well enough to keep that job, and that offense has been better with Russell Wilson and his experience, his ability to kind of throw the ball down the field as well and add that element, open up the run game. But I think that's a good step to Justin Fields potentially – being a starter somewhere else down the line. Was it going to, is it still going to be Pittsburgh as Russell's 37? And if I'm Pittsburgh, I would try to find a way to keep him around if that's possible. But Carolina, they could look at Justin, look at what he's done in Pittsburgh. Think that maybe this time around, he can really play good football consistently stretch the field and then be the guy. So that would be somebody I look at Jameis Winston. He would be someone as well. Marcus Mariota, who we saw earlier this season in Washington, ripped through this defense. Those are some of the names as far as like free agents that are like pending free agents uh, coming up this offseason, looking over at overthecap.com. I, I don't know how exciting those prospects are. The hope is that Bryce shows enough in the final seven games of the season that you bring in somebody. They're just here to back up. And yeah, they'll be younger. They'll be more athletic. But your hope is that they don't play and that Bryce continues to show that he's the guy and then they can give him the fifth year option and maybe figure out a deal in the off season of 2026 final question coming from bradley feel like i get this one like every week uh but we'll answer it again because you know every show is a new first show for i mean every, I, I get this wrong every time i try to say it every show is someone's first show there we go bradley says let's say bryce is slightly better slash more of the same and we get maybe two to four wins this season. Well, they already have three. Um, do you think it's more likely they pick another quarterback in the draft or just hedge bets on Bryce? I don't know what they're going to do, quite honestly. I really don't. When you look at this quarterback class, we have talked about this. I had people call me out on YouTube. Like, I, I rarely go and look at the comments. Um, I mean, most of it's nice. But then there's just people who are just complete a-holes. Um, who's sitting here watching me. Like, I don't even know why you watch. Uh, but whatever. People can say whatever they want. Um, but I had mentioned like Cam Ward in the conversations when we talk about quarterbacks, I always bring up like Quinn Ewers and Carson Beck not being impressed by them. And looking at like Mel Kuyper Jr., Trevor Sikama, and some of these consensus quarterback boards, Ewers and Beck are like around five and six. Like I'm not impressed by those guys at all. They came in as possible 
top 10 picks heading into the season. They have not played that way so far this year. But Shador Sanders, Cam Ward, Jalen Milrow, those guys have been the top three by far. And like Shador is excellent. The only issue I have with him is he holds on to the ball too long, especially behind what has not been a great offensive line. At least last year was far worse this year. That Colorado offensive line has been much better, giving him more of an opportunity to hit some talented receivers, man. They got dudes over there. Obviously, Travis Hunter should be winning the Heisman Trophy, but LeJonte Western, um, buddy from uh, Vanderbilt who went over there, what, Wilson, I can't remember his last name, but like, they got guys. Jimmy Horn, like that's – Colorado's got weapons, and I would love to see him in the playoff just to see what happens. Uh, probably won't win, but still would love to see it. But Shador is great. I just wonder whether Dion's going to let him come to Carolina, and I would guess no. Uh, Cam Ward, that's a hell of a story. Dude who was at Incarnate Word. It's just funny because like people are like, you never bring up Cam Ward. It's like, did you even know who Cam Ward was like three years ago? Did you even know that he followed Eric Morris, who was the head coach at Incarnate Word, over to Washington State to be the OC under Jake Dickert and brought Cam Ward with him to the Palouse? Did you know that Eric Morris now coached at North Texas? If you didn't, shut the hell up. Uh, but Cam Ward is really improved. Like He's a guy who has had whoopsie daisies as far as just like some crazy turnovers in the past and some extreme confidence in his arm. And that's, that's great. He's really improved. I think so far he's been outstanding at Miami and that's the kind of guy that you would love to have. It's also interesting to me because this is somebody who last year after those six quarterbacks went, like he was going to be the next one in like the third or fourth round. Now to go from that to one season now being a considered a top 10 pick, I always find it interesting. Guys got to improve, obviously, and their grades and evaluations can change. Absolutely. It's not like he's like one of these one-hit wonders. He has plenty of starting experience, whether it's been in the FCS, Incarnate Word, over in the former Pac-12, now Pac-2 at Washington State, to now in the ACC at Miami. Like, that's a guy who could be ready to go day one. I don't know. We'll see. Jalen Milrow has improved drastically as a passer with Caleb DeBoer and that offense coaching staff there at Alabama. Then last year when he was with Tommy Reese and Nick Saban, and that's shade at Tommy Reese and not Nick Saban, by the way. I, I have my doubts about Milrow. Like he looked awesome against Georgia the next week against Vandy. It's like, uh, uh, I didn't love it. And Tennessee didn't love that either. But then you watch him against LSU. It's like, God, this guy's such an athlete and he's going to be a difference maker with his legs. And, He'll come in instantly and be one of the better athletes in the NFL in terms of just a runner, period. I just wonder, like, he's got a just a missile of an arm down to down. He's gotten better as a passer. Can that translate to the NFL quickly, or is it going to be one of those guys you got to really work on? We'll see. Like, I feel like that guy could go back for another year. Like, another year under Kalen DeBoer at Bama, three years starting. You're probably going to end up getting, like, 50 starts because just how long their seasons go. Why not? But we'll see. Either way, all the draft nerds, and that's not me. I enjoy watching Shador because I enjoy watching him just go out there and have a, just put on a show with Travis Hunter. Do not care about his draft prospects. Cam Ward, I enjoy watching him go out there do the same thing in Miami. Don't care about his draft prospects. Jalen Miller, like when I watch college football, I'm not thinking about the draft. Garrett Nussmeyer as well. I've liked him. I saw him in person back when LSU played down in Columbia against South Carolina. Has not played well recently. Um, but I still like him, and I wonder, like, would he benefit from going back for another year? We'll see. His dad's Doug Nussmeyer, who used to be – I think he was a coordinator in the NFL, but he definitely has been a coordinator in college. Those are the guys. But the nerds say that there's not a consensus guy to take, like, in the top five at quarterback, and I think Carolina may be playing their way at the top five. It's just hard for me to say right now who to go out there and get when there just does not feel like that surefire player. Shador could be it. Cam could be it. Milro possibly could be it. I don't see it being back. I don't see it being yours. And I think Nussmeyer actually could be pretty good. So we'll find out. But we have a long time before we really need to talk about the draft this much. All right, it's going to wrap up this edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, hosted by yours truly, Julian Council. Again, y'all, subscribe or follow the show for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And be sure to follow me on Twitter at Julian Council, where I answer weekly Wednesday mailbag questions right here on the show. Either at me or David to get those questions in for next week's edition of the show. But in the meantime, be safe, be happy, be whole as always and forever. Keep pounding, and I'll be back here tomorrow as Locked On NFL Crossover Thursday presented by Price Picks are back. We'll talk to someone from Locked On Chiefs. Don't know who, but we'll talk to them.